Hi, this is Jeff Heaton. In this video, we're going to talk about the various error metrics that you use to evaluate a model such as a neural network. We'll talk about the different ones that are used for classification and regression, and what some of the differences really are between them. Some of these are very specific to the actual units that you're measuring in, and they are in the same metric as your test data. Some of them are designed to penalize for overconfidence in wrong predictions and others are designed to simply give you a consistent metric so you know the range is zero and one or some other values to know independent of the units of your y how good of a value you're actually getting now i have sample code for all of this provided in jupyter notebooks and a link to that is provided in the description and of course if you find this kind of thing interesting please subscribe to my channel and click the little bell so that you're notified of any additional videos that i create Okay, let's have a look at the individual error metrics that I'll cover in this. So here are all the imports that are necessary. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through the Python code. This video would go on for quite a while. I'm more talking about the actual error metrics and what they're for. Now I'm going to use three different, I won't call them data sets because they're just really the, the Y output that's expected and also the the y hat that the model would have predicted i'm not giving you the x or the model inputs because really we're just looking at how to evaluate the errors the how to build the model is is an entirely different topic this is just on how to deal with errors so binary classification those tend to have their own metrics that is where you're classifying into only two values it's going to be either one or zero. So y is what we are expecting. And these values here are what we are getting back from the model. So the model, in this case, that one, it classified that as 95% probability that it believes it's a one. So that's a that's a pretty good classification. Then for the, the zero, it was saying it's only 10% sure that this is a one. So that's also pretty good. Not as good as this one, but we continue onward. Some of these it will be wrong on. For example, the second to the last one is a one, but it's it's really off. It has very low confidence. It thinks it's only a 0 0.2 or 2% probability. We'll see later that it, it gets punished pretty good for that uh, by some of these, particularly log loss. So the expected is the y, the values from the actual model are the y hat. And here's a nice listing of all of them. That's easier to look at than the Python. Multi-class classification is kind of like what you had up there. It's also classification. But here, the expected value, this is a four class. So going to be one for the first one, two, three, one, so on, and zeros there. Of course, we. we we count starting with zero. How how else would you count? So here is, that is what that looks like. Now, if you have strings for these, like you might have animals like hamsters and guinea pigs and dogs and cats for your four classes, you're still going to map each of those four categorical values into a numeric value here. We're not dealing with dummy variables or that sort of thing. That is specific to certain model types. This is just a class label. Now the model, most models will output a probability vector because we have four different classes that we're dealing with. So for this first one, it's actually pretty, pretty wrong here. For class one, which is right here, because one is the second one, it's, it's actually saying a zero probability on that one. That's, that can get you really in a lot of trouble with, with certain, with log loss in particular. Most models will not predict a zero. They'll do at least a 0 0.1 or, or something like that. Just purely because with log loss, if you're getting zero points, the log of zero is negative infinity. So you don't want to get a infinitely bad score. It's better just to get a bad score. So this is the probability of each. You can think of this like your multiple choice question exams. You would fill in the A, fill in the B, fill in the C. Well, the way machine learning does it is you would put in a probability. So 
if you wanted to just fill in C, you would put a 1 here. But here, the model's able to say, you know, I'm only 90% sure. If you were really sure, but you thought it was maybe one of these two, but you have no idea, you'd set both of these to 0.5 and 0 on the outer two. Or you'd probably set them both to 0 0.9, 0 0.49, 0 0.49, and put a 0 0.01 on each side. Because you, you really want to try to avoid having 0 as the output. Now you don't have to worry about that, the models take care of it. And this is what the multi-class output looks like. Now it's very important that all of these values sum to 1. And there's just no way that I can visually double check everything. It's just not a skill of mine. You can ask many an English teacher who has had me in the past. So I have to write code to actually sum these all up. So all 1's perfect. Then our regression data. So the last two are classification data. This is our regression data. These are numeric y's, and then the y hats are the predicted values. And ideally, these would line up perfectly, but they don't. So that's what the error is evaluating. There's the nice. The first one that I'm going to look at is accuracy, precision, recall, and F1. I don't tend to use these a lot, but they are very popular, particularly for medical tests or uh, things where you're particularly interested in false positive versus false negative. The data, we have to do a little transformation on it. So we're going to use the binary classification, so that's it's either 0 or 1. I'm flipping them so that all the, you can't, you don't deal with 70% probable or that sort of thing it has to it's it's boolean it's it's positive or negative true or false so that's what this threshold is for all of the probabilities that were above 0 0.5 are considered true on the y hat on the predictions this is a very important part of test designs as you develop tests you want to set that threshold to a good value that segregates the trues from the false Accuracy, precision, recall, and F1 are very dependent on you setting that threshold. And changing the threshold will change the, the values that you get back for measuring how good your model is. There's other metrics that we'll see in a moment, namely AUC and ROC, are independent of the threshold. So we'll deal with false positives and false negatives. I give you the code all here to calculate this. I count how many false positives we had, how many a typo, I'll change that to a V later, negative count. So this is, this is the total number of positive values we had, the total number of negative values that we have. The total count better sum to that, so there's 11 total. And I'm going to calculate the true positive, true negative, and the false positive and false negative. You can see they're represented as percentages here. Accuracy is something we're pretty familiar with. This is almost like test scores. So if somebody tells you they scored 300 points on a test, you don't know if that's good or bad. It depends on if there's a thousand points on the test or if there's 300. Accuracy is often given to you in percents. So I showed you just basically two ways that we can calculate it. The kind of statistic, the true positive plus true negative divided by count. Or you can just use, this is the preferred way, just use the, the scikit-learn version. This gave me confidence that I had not messed up any of these equations up here. Now precision and recall are two, two statistics that you calculate, and then also F1. F1 is closely related to accuracy, but it gets more into the um, false positives and false negatives. You can see the calculations for these. These are usually between, or these are always between 0 and 1 values that are like percents. So the way this is often compared is precision is how useful your results are. Recall is how complete the results are. I always have to mentally think about those two before I refer to precision and recall. Then the F1 score, it's, it's somewhat like a percent, but it is taking into account the precision and, and recall, so you're getting your, uh, your, your false negatives, false positives also accounted for. Fusion matrices are useful for knowing which classes are commonly misclassified as others. They come from actual numeric matrices, like you see here. And this one is basically, you want to see a strong diagonal. So this is showing you 
that the true label was often false and predict and it was predicted true. So that shows you really where the model is having more issues with it. For the multi-class one, it's a little bit more interesting. Here you can see the diagonal is relatively strong until we get to the true label one. The true label one is often misclassified as zero, one, or two, but not as three. So that, that gives you some information. That plays into feature engineering. You'll, you might want to engineer out a feature that can help uh, to segregate those two predicted labels that are not being classified correctly. And normalized versus, versus not, these are counts, these are percents. Okay, an area under the curve. Area under the curve is closely related to the RSC chart. The code here is given to generate this for the, the binary classification. Here, I, I mean, essentially what this is measuring is as you adjust the threshold, what does it do to your true positive rate and your false positive rate? In a nutshell, you're trying to maximize this area under the curve. So the area under the curve is sort of the numeric culmination of this. It doesn't really show you the actual where where the area is maximized, but it gives you a numeric value that you can you can try to maximize. AUC is a very common metric in Kaggles. AUCs above 90% can be good. A lot of this just all depends. If it's too high, you have to worry about overfitting like just about everything. Decile analysis is where you are looking at the bins that values go into. So essentially, I get all of the predictions from the binary classification. There are probabilities, so the high ones are going to be close to 1, the low ones are going to be close to 0, and I basically count them up. And I count them up per bin, so I sort them, and then I put them into 10 bins. You can use other numbers, but 10 is usually what happens. And I look at basically of those, of those, however many values landed in the bins, and the bin count should be pretty similar. I mean, unless the number is a multiple of 10, they're not going to all be the same, the total number of rows. And then I count the number of true positives and get a percent. So 1.0 is perfect. So this, this very top bin, you know that those, those value, anything that's in the top bin of this one is probably pretty accurately predicted. The lower bins, you want to be low because those would be the values that should be false. So often you'll report the actual top 10% score as 1.0. This metric has a lot of different names that I've, that I've seen and tends to be used in marketing. You will plot the bars like this. So this shows a pretty accurate model up in the higher deciles. Usually they'll decline more gradually than this, but these are small contrived data sets that I put, that I put together. Regression chart. The regression chart is used on regression data. It's not a number. It's, it's simply a chart. You take the expected values and you sort them. So the blue value should be always increasing, monotonically increasing. It won't, won't go back down because it's sorted. But then you plot the prediction on each one of them. You can see this huge outlier issue, issue there that the prediction had made. That would be something that you would, you would want to definitely look at. And you can tell if it's overfitting or underfitting and in what area it's doing. So you can see in the middle values it's doing quite well, overfitting a little bit here and then and then evening out. I use these a lot when I'm analyzing regression models. Log loss. So log loss, I use log loss a lot. This can be used for single classification or multi-class classification. It is basically telling you how how good your model is. Low values are good, high values are, are bad. Zero is perfect and likely overfit. You can tell by looking at the log uh, scale or graph here, as you, as you are close to a 1.0, so if it was true and you predicted true, so one, that's near the perfect zero. 
But notice as how it falls off. If you were only 75% believing that it was true and it was truly true, then you're, you're down here somewhere below 1 and so on. You'll notice that it really does not go up fast until you get around to the 0 0.25, but as you approach 0, it goes, it goes nuts. So you could get an infinitely bad score if it was truly true, but you predicted zero probability that it was true. That's why most models will not output the extreme of zero. And what is a, what is a good log loss? I just give you some references here. Generally, the lower the better. But if, if it was 1.0 and so if you predicted a perfect score of 1.0, you'd get, you'd get zero if it was truly true. If it was true and you predicted only 95% probability, you would have a negative 0.5. That would be a really good log loss. And you can see how this increases as the percentile on average um, changes. As you get, if it was true and you predicted really, really not certain, you can see this, start, this starts to go up really pretty fast. R2, this is a classic statistical measure. Well, as many of these are. This is looking at, generally these are between 0 and 1. And we're going to use our regression values data set for this one. And it is going to give you a value generally between 0 and 1. If you do particularly bad, like this model did here, that's from that outlier, remember that big bump that was, that is why we have this negative 2.5. However, usually you want to try to up this to more like 1.0, uh, although 1.0 would probably be very overfit. So 0 0.95 or something, it's, it's a little bit like AUC in terms of what's good, what's, what's not good. So it's also normalized. Most of these that we're looking at so far have been normalized, meaning they're in very specific ranges that tell you the goodness of fit. RMSE and MSE are not. MSE is essentially a number that the higher it is, the worse your, your model is predicting. The numbers really don't mean anything for MSE. You're, it's, you're not really bringing them back to the original units that your Y was in, and you're simply, you're simply calculating them. RMSE, you take basically the square root of the MSE, and that now puts these in the same unit. So a score of 2 is not that good if you're trying to predict bananas or something such as that. But if you're trying to predict house values, the value of 2 is, is really good because those, those are hundreds of thousands or millions. All right, that is all of these. This code is available on GitHub, and I'll put a link to that in the description on YouTube. Of course, there's many more error metrics than just these, but these are some of the ones that I find that I use a lot. If you'd like to learn more about this sort of thing, please subscribe to my channel. Thank you for watching.